In this session we're going to be looking at linguistic symbols rather than traffic lights. I'm going to labour a particular way of looking at these because linguistic symbols are the, the heart of looking at languages in general and the concepts that are associated with looking at them uh, keep coming back over and over again so it's worth looking at them in some detail in the first instance. If we look at traffic lights every light has a form. It's either red or yellow or green. It's either on or off and the traffic lights exist in a linear sequence. They go on and off in time. Linguistic symbols however have more than just form. We will find that they have a function as well and function is going to be used in a particular way and I'm going to explain that by showing that linguistic symbols are not just in linear sequences they also exist in hierarchical sequence. That is, some units are, if you like, bigger, more abstract than others, at the same time as units come one after the other. As a result of that, it turns out that linguistic units have both function and form. And I'm going to illustrate that by looking at the sentence, Mary swims, which is a very short sentence. It's about as short as sentences get. It's also very boring and linguists often use boring sentences as examples in order to draw attention to their form rather than how interesting they are. If we look at this particular diagram it tells us something about the sentence Mary swims. It tells us that the sequence is a sentence. At the same time it tells us that it consists of two words one after the other. It's called a tree diagram for reasons of uh, remote history. If you turn yourself 180 degrees upside down you'll see why it's called a tree. It has a trunk um, at the bottom when you're standing on your head and it has branches um, going up the right way. Uh, for linguists trees always seem to be upside down. I don't know why that is. In this case the trunk is sentence and the branches are the words and they exist. Uh, the words are uh, in a linear sequence, one after the other. We can represent exactly the same thing by putting them in a box diagram and saying, well, the whole thing is a sentence and the two smaller bits, Mary and Swims, are words. And you'll see that these categories are, um, if you like, larger or more abstract or smaller and less abstract. So the sentence is a, a higher level unit and words are lower level units. As a result of that we can say that um, these units have linearity, they come one after the other. It's illustrated nicely by looking at the sounds of the sentence. If we look at Mary Swims it actually consists of nine sounds, one after the other. M comes before air, which comes before r, which comes before e. So nine sounds, you can work out the others if you wish, uh, they come one after the other. But there are also two words, and they're in a linear sequence. Mary comes before swims. So we have two sorts of linear sequence. We have a linear sound sequence, and we have a linear word sequence. At the same time, we also have a hierarchy. The form of the first word is that it consists of four sounds. So the word Mary has a form. It has an internal structure if you like which is that it consists of four sounds. The second word of course has an internal form it consists of five sounds. So this is hierarchical and it's linear at the same time and what tree diagrams and box diagrams show is both of those. If we look at a tree diagram from top to bottom uh, the top to bottom dimension shows the hierarchy and the left to right dimension shows linearity that is one thing following another in, in a line. Uh, if we want an analogy for this the best one I've been able to come up with is trains. If we suppose that a train emerging from a tunnel is like a sentence emerging from your mouth one unit emerging after another then we can see that trains are are quite similar to sentences in some ways. And here's a train. 
This is a very simple train. There are much more complicated trains, some of them with many, many trucks. And this train is a three-part train. It has an engine at the beginning, it has some trucks in the middle, and it has a guards van at the end. And it has a guards van because it's an English train. Uh, in the next diagram, we'll find that there's an American train. It looks exactly the same, but it has some different labels. So, what can we say about this? Well, the engine has a form. If we look at its internal structure, it has a cow catcher on the front. It has a little coal truck behind it. But if we look at its function, then we look at what it does in the train. It's an engine because of the job it does in the train. It provides the motive power for the train. The guards van, on the other hand, uh, occupies a different position. Its job is to bring up the rear of the train. So it has internal form and it has function in the train. Now it happens that guards vans are normally at the end of the train, so the form and the function are essentially related to each other. Let's have a look at the American train, um, this time in a box diagram. It has cars in the middle and a caboose at the end because that's what you get in North America. Later on we'll have a look at these dialect differences which are quite interesting. Essentially this diagram uh, gives you the same representation. The engine has a form. If we look down at its internal structure, if we look up in the box diagram, then it has a function. The engine functions in a particular way in the train. It turns out that over and over again when we look at linguistic units we find that they have both form and function. In the case of trains, form and function seem to go together. In the case of language, quite often form and function don't go together. Something with a particular form can function in a variety of places. Uh, something with a particular function uh, might have different forms.